In my last video, I was pretty honest with you guys and I showed you how messy my house had gotten and I shared how it had not been properly cleaned in weeks because of all of the summer and homestead and the farming related activities and responsibilities that we had happening. Since then, we had a chance to do a really good cleaning and decluttering. I had family coming from out of state so I wanted to get ready for them, but we also wanted to get ready for going back to homeschool. So both of these things were a really good motivation to get the house back in order. We took about a week and worked a little bit each day, cleaning and decluttering, and the house looks and feels amazing again. It's still under construction, of course. <laughs> that will be going on for a while. I am so glad, though, that we were able to find time to get the house decluttered and cleaned before school started back up. We started back to homeschool early so that we could ease in with half days. We wanted to do that because there's still so much summer fun left. We also have the garden going into full production right now. Speaking of which, and due to popular subscriber request, I'm going to share some of our favorite garden to table home cooked meals, including sourdough. I've got some sourdough English muffins I'm going to make, bagels, bread, and when it comes to the garden produce, we're going to make some bruschetta, one of our favorite cabbage salsas, pickles, yogurt, cucumber salad, fried green tomatoes, fried zucchini, fried eggplant, and lastly, I'm going to show you one of my favorite cookbooks that has been motivation for what to do with all the garden produce. And it's a cookbook I found over 20 years ago. It's, it's one of my favorites. In addition to that, I'm going to answer kind of a hard subscriber question that pulled my heartstrings a bit. I know some of you are curious to know what's been happening around the homestead. Well, we had another water hydrant go out and we weren't quite sure what was happening. We kept losing water pressure each day again. And I started worrying that perhaps since it's been very dry and we live on a mountain that maybe we were just running out of water. And so I said a prayer and that very day my husband came in and he said, well, I found out what's wrong. We have a water hydrant that needs to be replaced again. It's leaking. If you've been following us a while, you know that this happened to us last year in the dead of winter and we had to rent an excavator to dig through the frozen ground and help us replace the water hydrant down by the chicken coop. I can't tell you how thankful I was though to learn that we were not running out of water. It was just simply that this hydrant needed to be replaced. So that was an answer to prayer because I pray God, please don't let us run out of water. It happens sometimes here in these mountains where we live, but that wasn't the case here. So the guys took a Saturday and they replaced that hydrant. Actually, I think they took a Saturday and a Sunday. It was kind of a lengthy ordeal. They had to dig very deep, a very wide hole because they found a huge boulder in the ground. We were all thankful though that that's all that it was because if we were to run out of water, can you imagine this whole garden just going to absolute waste? So as you can imagine, we were very thankful that it was a simple fix. In this scene, I am making my husband some herbal tea harvested fresh from our herb garden. He's had a mild head cold lately and hasn't felt the best, so I decided he needed some nice tea, especially while he's out there working on replacing that hydrant. Our garden has been doing just marvelous. We have had so many green beans and so much good produce coming in that we haven't had to go shopping for produce at all. One of our favorite farm to table dinners is pasta. We love making pasta with a bunch of fresh rustic vegetables from the garden. Look at this, you guys. It's a clothes drying rack. It's a metal one. One of my subscribers, one of you lovely people out there that are following me gave me this idea because before we were drying it on my table. This works way better. I mean, look at it. We can hang the entire amount of pasta that we make on this rack and it fits perfectly. In this scene, I'm making some Play-Doh. Like I said, it's back to school here. And so for the younger kids, I decided to make some Play-Doh. We have all kinds of fun neon colors here. If you're interested, I'll link to my Play-Doh recipe down below in the description area. I'm gonna start with my sourdough here. Sourdough recipes are probably the most required requested recipes I get here at this channel. I find that freshly ground whole wheat seems to make a much happier, more bubbly, healthy sourdough starter. 
So I'm using my Nutramil grinder to grind some flour and when it comes out of this, it's nice and warm. And so it really speeds up the fermentation process. By the way, I love this grinder and I will link below in the description box to my review of it. Anyways, I find that using freshly ground warm flour and warm water helps to speed the bread making process. For my first years making sourdough, it would take a whole day to get the bread to rise. And then it had a little bit too strong of a sourdough taste. Well, I found that by doing this and a couple other things, I can get my sourdough bread to rise and finish from start to finish in about three hours. All right, right now I'm showing you the bubbles. This is how you know you have a healthy starter. So this is not ready yet. I'm getting it ready right now. I'm going to add the warm flour and warm water to this. And, and then I will show you the process. So you want to use distilled water or filtered water. If you use faucet water, sometimes there can be, you know, like different bacterias and organisms in that that don't do well with your sourdough or can destroy your sourdough's bacteria. I have about two and a half to three cups of sourdough starter. So I'm going to feed my starter with two and a half to three cups of feed. And I'm gonna mix the flour and the water here and I'm just gonna mix it in. You want equal parts. So if you have like four cups of sourdough starter, you're gonna want four cups of flour water mixture to feed it with. Today I'm feeding my whole batch of sourdough. I'm not going to be using all of this. I'm going to feed it and then I'm gonna put a portion of it back in the refrigerator and I'm just going to measure out just what I need for the breads that I'm making today. The English muffins, the bagels, and a loaf or two of plain bread for bruschetta. For all of that, I will only need about three cups of starter. So I'm just gonna measure it out and put the rest back in the fridge for next time I go to make bread. I'm gonna pour some nice hot, lukewarm, lukewarm faucet hot water that won't be too hot. You don't wanna get it too hot because it will kill your starter. But I'm gonna put some of the hottest water that I know the sourdough can handle into this metal bowl. This is a little trick that I've learned that really speeds up your sourdough process. I'm waiting for the water to get hot right now. It takes forever. <laughs> But I discovered that if you have a warm place to rise your starter before you use it, that it makes the bread making process go much faster. This is one of the tricks that I was telling you. So it's, it's almost 10 o'clock right now. And I want this bread to be done in time for dinner tonight. So I want it to go quickly. I'm going to set the starter that is inside of the measuring cups down inside this bowl and just let it go to rise. And like I said, this is gonna be ready to use probably in about an hour to an hour and a half if things go like they normally do. Okay, it's been about an hour and a half. Check out all those bubbles. This is how you know you have a healthy, happy starter that is going to make your bread rise. So now it's time to make our breads. I am using one cup of warm water, not too hot. If it's too hot, it will kill your starter. You want it to be just barely over lukewarm. Next, I'm putting in about a half of a cup of palm shortening. You can use butter, you can also use oil, olive oil, whatever you like, but some kind of an oil. And this is what keeps the bread nice and soft and keeps it from getting dried out and dense quickly. Sourdough bread can get very dense very quickly. It's best the first day that you make it. and. Each day afterwards, it gets a little bit drier. So adding some oil helps it to stay a little bit more pliable and moist for a little longer. Next, I'm putting in about three tablespoons of sugar, and then I'm going to put in about two teaspoons of salt. If you like, you can wait till towards the end to put the salt in. Putting the salt in first, it's supposed to do something to the gluten and like stall it for a while or something like that. And so it does work better if you put the salt in later, but you don't have to. Now I'm putting in one cup of sourdough starter. I don't use the paddle mixer for this very often. Usually I find it works great just to start out with the hook since I have a KitchenAid. Of course, if you don't have a KitchenAid, you wouldn't do this. You would gradually add in flour, but I have this KitchenAid. So I just add all the flour all at once, I add 
three and a half to four cups of flour and then I see what it's like from there if it needs more flour. Usually it does not. It just kind of depends on how much moisture was actually in your sourdough starter. So I'm going to let this mix. This is what it looks like. You want to let it mix for five to ten minutes. Okay, I'm showing you what it should start to look like. See how this is getting nice and stretchy and elasticy? That's what you want. That's how you know it's going to be a good bread. This is how you know the gluten has started to activate and do its thing, and that's what you want. This is a little too sticky, so I'm adding about a half of a cup of flour. When it starts to pull away from the sides of the bowl like this, it's perfect. You want to be careful not to get sourdough too dense and you don't want it to be too sticky. So if it's sticking to your hands, it's probably still just a little bit too moist and you can add a tiny bit of flour at a time until it's not sticking to your hands. Since I have several batches to make, I am going to just knead this first batch for a second and set it here until I have the rest of the batches made. Probably one of the biggest mistakes people make when they're making bread is with the addition of flour, either putting too much or too little in and not mixing it long enough for the gluten to activate. I am going to show you guys one of my favorite little tricks. For years, I struggled with having bread stick to the pan, and there's nothing more frustrating than having half of the loaf break inside of the pan because it got stuck in there. And you know what? No matter how many times I grease the pan or how well I grease the pan, it always seemed to stick. And I learned parchment paper. Parchment paper is the trick. So this is what I use always and I don't have to use any extra oil or anything. This is just a stoneware bread pan that I have and I line it with parchment paper and then put the bread in. I hope you guys can kind of tell what the feel and the texture of the bread should be by watching this video. I'm trying to like stretch it and show you what it's supposed to look like and feel like. And if it's not like this, let's say it's too dry it will make a drier bread you'll de definitely want to make toast out of that <laughs> and of course if it's too moist it's gonna have a lot of holes in it. it's gonna fall apart when you go to cut it I like to put a little bit of oil on the top of the bread just to help it rise higher some people like to use a wet cloth I find that with sourdough it needs to rise longer than traditional bread so a lot of times the wet cloth will stick to it or start to dry out and when it starts to dry out because it's been on there so long it sticks to the top of it and then rips the top of your sourdough. So I like to use just some oil. With this particular loaf, it's the loaf I'm saving for tomorrow. I don't want this one for tonight. So I'm going to put it in the fridge to rise very slowly and stall the process a little bit for 24 hours or so. And I will pull it out tomorrow to finish rising it. So I'm going to put plastic wrap on it and put it in the fridge so I can pull it out tomorrow. And this is something I love about sourdough, how you can make it in advance like this, put it in the fridge and then pull it out the day you want to use it. If I have a week that I know is gonna be super packed, I will make up a whole bunch of bread, keep it in the fridge, and just pull it out day by day as I know I'm going to be using it. I'm going to start the bagels here, and we definitely wanna line the pan. Now, I used wax paper, and I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I should have just used the parchment paper to line this pan, and I won't make the wax paper mistake again. But I am going to now start assembling the bagels and I'm going to put them on here and again I'm making the bagels tomorrow I just want to start them today tomorrow is going to be Sunday so I don't want to be doing a whole bunch of baking and cooking on Sunday I just want to be able to like pull these out and quickly make them and boil them and cook them so I am putting this on here and I'm going to be putting these in the fridge to rise as well they will do just a tiny bit of rising and then tomorrow when i take them out they're going to finish rising i found this everything but the kitchen sink bagel mix it's 
one of our favorites. We love bagels with all of the fixings on top. So I found this at Costco. I'm going to put it right inside because I have trouble getting the seeds to stick to the top. I know I could do egg and everything, but again, that's more steps. So I'm just going to put the stuff right inside of the dough while it's mixing. In this scene, here's another loaf that I'm making, and I want to use this for the English muffins. So I want to let it rise slowly as well because I'm not going to actually be making the English muffins today. I'm going to be making them tomorrow too. And so I'm putting it in this bowl and I'm covering it with oil and setting it aside. I will put that in the refrigerator later to rise slowly. And I'll pull, pull it out tomorrow uh, about four or five hours before I plan to cook with it. That is something I forgot to mention earlier. You want to pull it out of the fridge in plenty of time to get it to rise because it takes a long time to warm up to room temperature and then it doesn't start rising until it does warm up to room temperature and slightly above actually. To make the bagels, I just make a little roll and then I put a hole in the center and <laughs> have a little bit of fun obviously. Uh, they, I, I like to make a very large hole in the center because they rise and that hole pretty much disappears. With these bagels, I'm going to be making cream cheese and roast beef sandwiches with them. Next up, pickles. Our family loves pickles. We love hamburger dills, relish, pickles, the works. We just love pickles. So I'm going to be making some pickles. This is some cabbage. I'm going to be saving it for later. You guys, I learned something not very long ago. If you keep your produce with ice in a cooler, it lasts longer than it will in the refrigerator as long as you change the ice out every day. So I've been keeping all of our produce in the cooler and it saves up space in the fridge. For my pickles, I am using two heads of dill. I like to use everything. If you take your onions that you've grown a lot of times people throw away the tops, but if you're making pickles, you can use those tops. You can actually use the tops in a lot of things. So I'm using the tops, just a couple of the long pieces from the tops. I'm using a half a teaspoon of mustard. And again, I'm using powder because I still don't have the mustard seed. And then I'm using about six peppercorns and about a clove to two cloves of garlic. If you love garlic, you can put two in. You can put more in if you want even. The garlic helps give the pickles just more depth of flavor. If you would like to use chilies instead of peppercorns, you can. They're wonderful as well. Next, we're going to stuff the jars and then just process these according to the ball canning book, which says to process them for 10 minutes in a boiling water canner. In the meantime, while all this was happening, look what my husband ended up bringing up from the garden, a wheelbarrow full of corn. This is our first corn harvest. My husband volunteered to help process it, so we're going to do that today as well. Here is my electric boiling water canner. Check out my makeshift kitchen, guys. It's an outdoor kitchen. We have the table we bought last year that I'm at right now, and then Last spring, I found another table, the white table in this scene, at the second hand store, and it was super cheap, so I snagged it. I have done most of my canning this year outside here at this makeshift kitchen, and I love it because it is so bright, and the brightness helps me have more energy longer throughout the day, and I'm able to do longer days by canning simply outside. So I have been loving this whole setup. This boiling water canner has been so valuable. It's one of the best purchases that I have made so far. You can pretty much set it up anywhere and use it anywhere, including outside, obviously. I'm blanching the corn and then dunking it in the ice bucket here, and the family is taking it all off the cob while I continue doing the activities inside with the pickles and the bread. Speaking of which, I'm going to start the salsa inside and I'm going to be making a fermented salsa. If you guys have never made fermented salsa, it is so good. I got it from this cookbook, Nourishing Traditions, and I'm going to be making this recipe. This is one of the cookbooks. This is not the cookbook I mentioned earlier. It's just one of the cookbooks that I have used for over 20 years and I love this cookbook. And they have recipes, all kinds of recipes for fermenting, safe fermentation processes. I am still loving my Nakano knife. I'm gonna link to it below with a discount code for you guys that are watching. This is a wonderful knife. It's made with Japanese steel. 
This is the Mito Santuko knife, and it is handmade in Seikai, Japan by craftsmen using ancient Japanese crafting techniques that have been passed on for generations. The stainless steel is strong and very durable, and the blades are very sharp, which is wonderful. I need sharp knives. I don't have time to mess around with dull blades as much as I have to cook all of the time. The handle is made of natural olive wood and it's just a beautiful knife. It's high carbon stainless steel with the blade as well, which is something I forgot to mention. These knives are recommended by Michelin chefs throughout the world and used in some of the most renowned restaurants. So if you're in need of some really good knives, definitely check them out. I'll link to them below. I'm going to be adding tomatillos to this recipe. I have always been able to add certain things like this with great success. If you guys have never tried fermented salsa, you have got to try it. There is nothing quite like it. I was blown away the first time I made some and tasted it. It's got a whole new layer of flavor that is just really hard to explain. Every time I serve this for friends and family, they are blown away as well. Everybody raves about it and asks for it when they come. <laughs> I like to use my Cuisin Art to dice all of the produce up to just the right size. When you're making your fermented salsas, it's nice to have everything close to the same size so that everything ferments at the same time. If you have big chunks and little chunks, well, the little ones are gonna be done before the bigger ones are, and that can risk making your salsa go bad before it's actually finished. So it's important to have everything in your salsa close to the same size. Look at the bright, vibrant colors. As this ferments, it is going to turn more of a brown color. And although the brown color doesn't look as appetizing, don't let that fool you, it's wonderful. You can skip the fermentation process and eat this as is, my family loves it just like it is right now as well it is a ex flavor explosion honestly it's so good i had a little extra and so <laughs> the family is just gobbling it up right now and like i said um it's not fermented so i'm putting a weight on top i will link below to the fermentation equipment you want the weight so it holds the vegetables and, and the fruits down deep inside the jar because you don't want those on top. You want the liquid completely covering it. Otherwise, the stuff on top will go bad before it's done fermenting. So you wanna wait. And I like these lids. They're really important. They allow the gases to escape and they prevent oxygen from getting inside of the jar. There's also an extractor pump, which allows you to take out extra air from inside the jar. I definitely recommend this if you're new to fermentation. Next up, we're gonna start the fried eggplant. Eggplant can be tricky. Some people think they hate it, and I think that it's probably because it was prepared improperly. Whenever you make eggplant, you want to soak it in salt water before you go to cook with it. And you wanna soak it in salt water for one to two hours from what I've researched. This helps to draw out some of the bitterness and the flavors in the eggplant that are not good for you, but also don't taste very good. I am using my husband's mandolin to make this. I love this mandolin. I bought it for my husband for Christmas, I think. And I've only recently started using it and I don't think I'll ever go back. I love how you can adjust the thickness of the things that you slice. This has been so handy this whole harvest season. We've been using it for pickles and tomatoes and all kinds of things. In this scene, I'm showing you how I like to do the eggplant. I am just sprinkling salt in between each of the layers and then I'm going to put some cold water over the top to let it soak. You don't have to use the cold water, but you can. And so now I'm just gonna set this aside to soak for a while and I'm gonna start preparing the zucchini. Personally, I like to cut these into wedges like this. So they're kind of like a thick French fry or like a Jojo. And I like to coat these and fry them that way. I think they taste best when they're in this shape to me anyways. I don't know about you guys, but there's something about fried zucchini that I just find so 
lovely. I think it's probably one of my favorite comfort foods. We have some tomatoes with some blossom in rot. So I'm pulling them off the plants and I'm pulling the green ones that have the blossom in rot off so that the plant can put its energy into making new, stronger tomatoes. We have been putting calcium on, but unfortunately, I don't think the calcium is getting to the roots because of our irrigation system. We have an irrigation system instead of a sprinkler system. So I don't think enough of the calcium is being brought down to the roots. So we've been working on different things to try to remedy that. But in the meantime, I am using up the green tomatoes and I love fried green tomatoes. Did you guys ever watch that movie? I remember watching that movie. I, I don't remember how old I was, but I loved that movie, Fried Green Tomatoes. And that's where I got the idea to make fried green tomatoes or give them a try. And I'm so glad I did. They're always a hit. My family was surprised. My kids were surprised. They didn't think they were going to be very tasty, but they ended up loving fried green tomatoes. To make them, you just cut the core out and I will say that you want these to be around one eighth of an inch thick. That's where they taste the best to me. You can do them thicker. I personally like them up to a quarter inch thick. You don't want to get them too thick though. But of course, the thinner they are, the more crispy they will get. So if you like a crispy fried green tomato, you want to make them thin. But if you like one that has a little bit more texture to it, you can make them thicker. For the amount of fried zucchini, eggplant, and tomatoes that I'm making, I'm gonna do about three or four eggs. I'm gonna whip these up and I'm just gonna dump everything in here with these. There is a life valley it's been a couple of hours and my eggplant is ready to go. So I'm going to just whip these eggs up. Now there's a little trick that I've learned through the years if you want to add more layers of flavor. If you add your herbs and your seasonings to the flour, that's good, I recommend doing that, but I recommend splitting it. So if you put your seasonings, half of the seasoning in with the egg, it doesn't burn. Sometimes certain seasonings will burn if you put them in the flour, like your delicate herbs. So I like to put the herbs in with the eggs and the salt in with the flour that I coat these with. I am just adding everything all to the same bowl and I'm tossing it with the egg. I decided to try za'atar. I think I'm saying it correctly, za'atar, za'atar seasoning to the egg. And I'm glad I did. This was delicious, you guys. I highly recommend this as a seasoning with your vegetables. I think that's a mistake a lot of people make though when they're cooking vegetarian dishes. They don't add enough seasoning. And the seasoning is where it's at when it comes to cooking anything that is more vegetarian in nature. So I'm adding half the salt, for this recipe to the egg mixture and I'm going to add the other half of the salt to the flour mixture when I go to make that. Check it out. See this brown liquid? This is what I'm talking about. This is what you want to extract from your eggplant with the salt. You don't want to eat this. This stuff is bitter and it's got apparently certain chemical constituents in it that are really not that healthy to eat, which is why sometimes eggplant being in the nightshade family can give some people some joint issues and cause some pain and inflammation. But by extracting this out with the salt, it's supposed to make it better for people that have issues with nightshade vegetables. I am rinsing out all of the eggplant now and taking the extra salt off. Eggplant's kind of like a sponge. It's going to soak up a lot of the salt, so you have to be careful with adding salt when you're making anything with eggplant that you have soaked in salt. The more times you soak it and rinse it like this, of course, the more salt will be taken out. When in doubt, always undersalt because when this comes off the frying pan, you can always add more salt if you find it's needed. And here we go we're gonna start grilling this and frying it most of you are gonna probably 
coat your vegetables this way. This is the way I learned to do it, and this is the way I always used to do it. It used to take me about two hours. So you can do it this way if you prefer, but I'm gonna show you guys another way to do this. The big family mama way to do this. <laughs> so check this out. Sometime after my fourth kid was born and I found I just didn't have time to stand at the stove coating piece by piece for hours, I discovered this. Just dump all your flour mixture right in to a large container that has a lid and lots of room to shake it and put a whole handful, you don't even have to make sure it's separate, just put a whole handful of your zucchini, eggplant, whatever it is, and shake it up really good. Now, there's a little more waste this way, but you can always take the flour and egg that is left behind because some of it does get goopy left behind. You can always fry that up and use it so you don't have to let it go to waste. But doing it this way is much faster. It will probably save you, depending on how many people you're cooking for, <laughs> it can save you up to an hour or more. I have a bonus recipe I'm going to show you guys with green beans. These are Asian sesame green beans, and they're so simple. All that you need to do is take a handful of green beans or however many green beans you want. You want to saute them at pretty high heat with some sesame oil, and you can also sprinkle in some sesame seeds. Now this pan is really hot, so this is going to go super fast, but this is just so tasty, you guys. Of course, if you like, you can add a little bit of teriyaki sauce or soy sauce to this or coconut amino sauce, which is delicious and it's what I like to use. Another one of our favorite garden to table dinners is salad, of course. I have got salad here and kind of like a cob salad with eggs from the garden. We have a full feast tonight. It's the perfect summertime dinner. It is now the next morning. This is Sunday morning and I'm making English muffins for the family to eat. This dough is slightly thicker than I like it to be. My sourdough didn't rise as high as it normally would. I accidentally put too much salt in when I was making this recipe, which I've never done before, at least not for a very long time. It's just not a mistake I make very often. So this didn't rise as high as it normally wood and the dough is a little denser than normal but it's still going to be fine you simply form the dough into patties like this fry them you can fry them with a little bit of oil the trick is not to cook them at too high of a temperature so i guess when i say fry it's probably not the right word you want the temperature to be low enough that they get cooked at least halfway through while we're waiting for those to cook i'm going to show you this is that cookbook i was telling you about i found this cookbook when i was probably 15 and I fell in love with it. This cookbook has the most amazing recipes for vegetables. So if you have a garden that is producing and you have a lot of variety in the garden, this cookbook is gonna be your best friend. There is dairy used in this and eggs, but other than that, it's a vegetarian cookbook and it just uses fresh produce that you can get straight from your garden. And some of these recipes are like off the charts good. One of the first recipes I made was the Thai salad for my family. I remember making this when I was 16. It is so good and my family just raved about it. My stepdad hated vegetarian food. So when I made this for him, he thought it was pretty impressive. Highly recommend this cookbook. Next up, the guys are gonna make some Balkan cucumber salad from that cookbook. Our son, he is a teenager now, but when he was five, he loved cooking so much that I went and I bought him a little kitchen cooking set. And he is just our little connoisseur. He loves different foods and tasting dis different foods and he seems to really enjoy cooking so we're kind of all pulling together the guys are making most of this salad but i'm gonna go get some of the parsley and some of the herbs for the salad because they don't know where they are outside in the garden <laughs> i've got the bread that just came out of the oven we're gonna be having this tonight for dinner and the guys are over here just slicing away my husband is 
caught comfortable letting our son use the mandolin or any of the kids use the mandolin really. So he's using the mandolin and cutting these cucumbers really thin while our son gets the parsley ready and it's just a sweet Sunday. We love cooking together as a family, especially on Sunday. These are the knives that I bought for our son when he was too young to use real knives. The salad ended up tasting so good. Everybody was surprised because the salad has mint in it, but it ended up being really tasty. All right, this is our cabbage salad. I'm not sure it could be any easier to make. You basically chunk up red onions, your cabbage, tomatoes, and put some lime over the top. It's a dressing and enough salt to taste. Pepper makes it even better. This salad's a great way to use up cabbage and it never lasts very long in our family. In fact, my husband made vegetarian tacos for our family with this is the base and none of the kids could get enough <laughs> of the tacos. They thought it was amazing. I bagged our corn in our zwilling bags. The thing is when you use zwilling bags and you use the pump, you want to let the corn freeze before you extract the air. Otherwise the juice will get sucked up and ruin the pump. So that's a little trick I learned that I wanted to share with you guys. Now that our homeschool year has started, we are needing to incorporate more audio books than we ever have in our DVD player is not playing any of our audiobooks anymore. It's kind of breaking down. So I decided I'm going to get a CD player. And one of the reasons I have not done this sooner is because they're all always so ugly. So I went shopping and I'm like, there's got to be a better looking CD player on the market these days. And then there was. I found this adorable little vintage CD player. I'll link to it below. And I snagged it. It comes in different colors. And of course, I picked white. Really briefly, I wanted to show you guys some pictures of our kittens and puppies. We have both. And so it's really starting to feel more like a farm around here all of the time. All right, back in the kitchen. It's time to make the bagels. The trick is with these, you want to drop them into your boiling water. As soon as they float, you can take them out and put them on the cookie sheet, which should be lined with parchment paper. Otherwise, they will stick very badly. So I'm going to put about three in this pot. And as soon as they float, I'm going to take them out and put them on the cookie sheet to bake. Once I have the cookie sheet all filled up, I'm going to pop them in the oven and bake them until they're done at about 350 degrees. In a minute, I'm gonna answer that subscriber question and I'm going to show you more clips of this process while I answer that question. These bagels ended up being a big hit. They were absolutely delicious and made the best sandwiches that were gobbled up in a little bit of no time. <laughs> now it is time to make the bruschetta. Bruschetta is one of the most simple things you can do with tomatoes. It's a very filling dish for us. I make a huge batch of it and sometimes we'll just have it as a whole meal because that's how much we personally love bruschetta. It is super simple. I like to use slightly firm tomatoes and you just chop them up. And I like to do some that are smaller and some that are larger in size. So some of them I'll dice and some of them I will chunk up. And I find that just adds to the rusticness as well as to the texture. Whenever I make bruschetta, I make it entirely to taste and that means I don't measure. <laughs> I have got some fresh basil from the garden. We have had the worst year for growing basil. Usually I can get rows and rows of basil, but this year I guess it just wasn't warm enough at the right time for the basil. At least that's what one of my friends who is also an experienced gardener suggested. She said basil seems to like the heat. so. We didn't have it at the right time for this basil. <laughs> Do you see that little hand there? It keeps sneaking tomatoes. <laughs> My youngest child loves tomatoes, so he keeps sneaking his hand in the little tomato dish. I'm going to dice this basil up. And again, I do everything to taste. So I probably have about five cups of tomatoes here, and I'm going to be putting in at least a half a cup of loose basil. It's not going to be packed basil, probably half a cup of loose. I'm going to add the salt definitely to taste and just taste it as I go. And then I'm going to add to this amount of tomatoes, like I said, five cups. I'm probably going to add about a quarter of a cup of balsamic vinegar 
and some pepper. I'm going to mince up the garlic. I've made the mistake before of not mincing the garlic finely enough. If you have big chunks of garlic that are raw that are going into this, they can kind of give some people a little bit of a stomach ache. So it's really important that the garlic is minced very fine, even mashed is good. Since the little people in our house are not crazy about onions, I found the best way to put the onions in this dish is to mince them up as fine as possible. Never any complaints if I mince them up small enough. This dish still goes quickly. <laughs> they eat it up and gobble it up in just a couple blinks of the eye. <laughs> I'm going to serve this bruschetta on our sourdough homemade bread and I'm going to toast it up. It's not good if you just put it straight on the bread. It gets too gooey and soft and soggy. You definitely want to toast the bread. So I'm going to cut this up into smaller pieces and then toast it. So on this particular evening, I was even serving my children's friends. I was I was watching a friend's kids this evening and they came over for dinner and even my friend's children, my children's friends loved it and they were all pretty young. So when you've got young kids that love this dish, you know you've got a pretty good dish and it's all raw and it's got the enzymes in it, it's so healthy. It's the perfect summertime treat. I believe that is all the recipes I had to share with you guys today. In this next scene though, I'm gonna do a little homemaking. I bought this table with a tile top and I've regretted it ever since. Uh, tile in kitchens, I think that went out of style for a very good reason. This table requires so much time in cleaning. I'm constantly wasting time, I feel like, cleaning this table and all of the grout. So I decided there's got to be a better way. And I looked online and I saw that there is a waterproof wallpaper essentially. And it is like a vinyl. So I decided to give it a try. And so that's what I'm doing in this scene. So in the next scenes, I'm going to be replacing the top with that wallpaper vinyl. And I'm also going to do a little bit of cooking. I'm going to show you guys more in depth cooking scenes from earlier that I've done throughout this video. So I'm basically the cutscenes, and we're gonna talk. I'm going to answer that question that I told you about that I had received from a subscriber. So I got a question from this poor mama who seemed to be in a great deal of disbelief that I get done with what I do get done in a day and a week and all of it with my kids around. And I don't think she even knew that I homeschooled for 14 years and have been homeschooling. She even wondered if I send my kids off with grandparents or something like that so that I can get things done around the house. But then she went on to explain something that made everything that she asked make sense. She explained that she was an orphan and things just seemed really impossible for her right now and she's just trying to find possible. I don't know about you, but I can definitely relate to that. In fact, the biggest reason I started my blog and this YouTube channel was for people just like her. I wanted people like her to know that they are not alone. I think for me, one of the breaking points was when my third child was born and then again after my fourth. I remember trying to manage meal times along with having a really tiny rundown home, trying to take care of the kids, homeschooling and parenting. And I remember thinking, is this some kind of joke? How do people do this? Growing up, I had always seen and known a lot of homemaking, homeschooling mothers who always seemed to have it together. But not long after my fourth was born, I remember 
all of the pressure of all of those things just really got to me and I remember hitting a really low place. We were living in the Midwest, of course, and I did not have any support whatsoever. In fact, I had discouragement where support usually is for a lot of families. That is a long story in itself, which I'll skip for now. But I will say I had been dealing with a lot of trauma from some extended family situations. So there was that on top of things. So essentially, what I'm trying to say is I never really had anybody to pick up the phone and call on to help out with my kids. Okay, so back to after my fourth was born, I was really struggling and wondering how people do this homemaking, homeschooling, and parenting thing. I didn't have long distance calling, so it cost to make phone calls back home, but I did one day. I called back home to an old friend. I started asking her about some of the homeschooling homemakers that I knew that were 20 years ahead of me, and I was hoping to get their phone number so I could call them and talk to them and pick their brains for advice. (laughs) One by one, though, as I listed off names, my friend told me that so many of the ones that I had wanted to speak with, that I had known growing up, were now going through really hard times because many of them were going through divorces. I was heartbroken. I was utterly devastated and I felt doomed at that point. (laughs) Eventually I did find one woman who had 11 children and I didn't know her very well and I still don't, but she was willing to talk with me and she was really encouraging. But still it was hard. Eventually one day in tears, I was on YouTube and I found a mom close to my age with about the same amount of children and she was sharing her journey. She was so strong and she was so encouraging. And I knew then that I was meant to do more. I knew that I could do this. And I knew also that I was meant to do what she was doing with her YouTube channel and encourage others. So there's a little history for you. That's how I got started doing this. I think that I should explain something to those of you that might be watching this video and following my channel and wondering how I do what I do. I think I should explain that I didn't become all of this overnight. I had time to become who I am and learn what I have learned. I got a very early start in homemaking, which gave me a leg up. And so I've had time to build one skill upon another. Some people start their homemaking journey and they don't get it ease in like I did. They basically get pushed in and they already have families, they've got kids, some of them are starting to try to homeschool, not all, but some. And I wanted to say that's harder, that's much harder. I kind of had it easy since I didn't get to ease in. <laughs> I have time to build my family and add things in slowly as I was able. I also want to share that there are seasons in motherhood and some of them are really hard. And if you've got a kid under two, you're in one of those seasons. So when I had four kids, I definitely was not homesteading or gardening. I might have been had a few homesteading activities, but I was not doing all that I'm doing right now. Okay? So I just wanted to share that. I also want to share something else that I think really needs to be said. Okay, I think a lot of people are going to be able to relate to this, especially if you are a homemaker. Growing up, one of the people I looked up to and wanted to be just like was my step grandma. She was a superstar to me. She was a legit, bona fide 1950s housewife. And she did all the things, almost. So I did the same thing that I think a lot of us do when I became a homemaker. I think a lot of us have idealized things about those 1950s housewives that we don't realize we've idolized. So I would like to expose a few things about those 1950s housewives that you might not know or maybe you haven't thought of. Although I deeply respect and admire my grandmother's generation and although I do strongly believe in being a homemaker for our families and I believe that this is a ministry, I think it's really important to keep it real. As a homemaker and a homeschool mom as well, it's 
even more important to acknowledge that those 1950s homemakers were not homeschooling. I see so many mamas these days putting impossible standards on themselves to keep the perfect home, the perfect homeschool, and not miss a beat. I've made this mistake myself. So many homeschool mamas especially are sleep deprived with small children and wondering why they cannot keep up the way their moms and grandmas may have. (laughs) It's because in a lot of situations, their moms and grandmas weren't doing all that they are trying to do now. I'm going to tell you another somber fact that I learned from my 1950s housewife grandma one day. (laughs) She shared with me that many of the women of her generation were consistently overprescribed psychotropic drugs. I think I said that right. Valium. Okay. I think that was the drug of the day. It's common knowledge that many of the women of that generation were taking drugs like Valium. So remember that the next time you get to feeling down on yourself and your homemaking abilities, remember not to compare yourself to your grandmother who you thought did it all, but maybe didn't. The next thing I'd like to share and kind of disclose is that I I kind of hit on this a little bit earlier, but it takes time. It takes time to learn the skills of homemaking and balancing families and parenting full time. It doesn't happen overnight. Fortunately for me, as I mentioned, I got an early start, which helped. My first job was actually learning to make bread and making it for a neighbor. And of course, my mother taught me this and I remember it well. I was only 10. It was hard work stirring that dough with little stringy spaghetti 10 year old arms. (laughs) And at 14, my mother got sick. So I took over everything except for running the laundry. It held that I was fascinated by everything having to do with home economics, and I made it my mission to learn everything having to do with homemaking that I could possibly learn. So you see, I had been a homemaker for more than 10 years before I even became a mother. That gave me a really big advantage. I did not start from a place of leaving the workforce and going directly into motherhood with a gaggle of children and, you know, homemaking. As I said, I've had time to build the skills I have, and I've built them one by one. So no, I don't have help. There's no grandparents that take my kids. And if you're new to homemaking, my biggest piece of advice would be that if you're feeling overwhelmed, step back and add things in one by one. Take baby steps. Also remember the thing I said about seasons in homemaking and motherhood. And there's some seasons where really big things are happening, but it seems like everything is moving really slowly. It can feel really unproductive in those times, and that can cause a lot of mom's anxiety. So if you're in a season with a variety of small children, then you're probably in survival mode and that's okay. It won't always be that way. It will get easier. In addition to that, life can bring traumas, There's ups and downs that you have to compensate for. So if you are just getting used to homemaking and you're feeling like a failure, please give yourself some grace and give yourself some time. One of the biggest mistakes I've seen people make when it comes to the concept and the art of homemaking is to grossly underestimate the complexity of the job. It's not a job that comes with training like other jobs either. Another thing about it is you're essentially on the same plane as somebody who's self-employed, which means you have to be (laughs) self-motivated. That right there is what trips up a lot of people. You can always tell the people that have never done homemaking or tried it and hated it and failed because they're the ones that think homemakers don't do anything all day. (laughs) The truth is that successful homemakers are some of the hardest workers out there. Many are working 13 to 17 hours a day. And I think I talked a lot about this in my previous video, which you can watch. It's got some of the tips that I've learned in my past 30 years of homemaking. I have a Bible verse that I want to share. It helps me and it helps me remember that there's a bigger thing happening. And it helps me just keep going when it is hard to do this job. This is Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. 
I think this verse applies really well to homemakers. I mean, essentially, that is what we are consistently doing is dying to ourselves and learning to be less selfish. Now, on that note, I want to say there's a difference between self-care and being selfish, okay? So don't get me wrong on that. In fact, I have some videos on the importance of self-care, and I will try to remember to link to those below this video. There's one more verse I do want to share, though, and it's Proverbs 31, 27. She watches over the ways of her household and doesn't eat the bread of idleness. This work of homemaking, being a homemaker and a mother, it is important work and it has an eternal value and I think that it's so easy to forget that in the midst of the world, the way that things are and the society pressures that are on so many of us. You guys, in this line of work, you have to take joy it's not going to come to you it's not going to easily happen you have to intentionally go around your home and your day and you have to choose joy and it's like a muscle that you are working out and eventually it gets easier and easier and easier to find joy and motivation in this job something that i have been finding is that i struggle with overwhelm easy I, I have anxiety, chronic anxiety, so for me, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. One of the things that I find helps is I do have these posters posted in my office, and I will try to remember to link to those below for you, and they teach me some steps to take. But one of the things that I find helps is to pray against the spirit of overwhelm. Also, gratitude, going around my home being thankful even if the room is in under construction or you know if my kids are loud and you know they're just being really unruly or something in the day to be grateful to find gratitude and also just to pray because God knows what it is that's overwhelming us and he doesn't want us to feel overwhelmed he actually specifically says that in the scriptures so I hate to sound like a broken record but talk to God cast your anxieties on him throw them on him and whenever it comes back which maybe it'll be five minutes maybe it'll be an hour maybe it'll be tomorrow but every time it comes back if you can make a habit of just taking it to him and trusting eventually it can make a difference <laughs>